It is having impacts, you know, downstream, but it, it is not the ticking time bomb I think that we historically thought it was. And I think that speaks to um, the willingness of scientists in the Bay Region to, to keep an open mind and let the science tell them, you know, what dictates the management. And I think this was an example of if you talk to people six years ago about Conowingo, they would have said, you know, uh-oh, we really need to do something about it. Now with the new science, I think it's still we need to do something about it, but it's it's not the Armageddon of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, clearly what that study also showed is that the state cleanup plans are more important in terms of restoring the bay than, than any kind of major dredging thing that you would want to do at the dam. There is no question that big storms are bad for the bay, right? Because we, we get a lot of pollution moving into the water. We get sediment, we get nutrients associated with sediment, we even get toxic chemicals. So, um, you know, when, when folks point to satellite images of this plume coming down the Susquehanna or the Potomac, I mean, w we know big storms are, are hard for the Bay. The question is, how much worse were they because of the Conowingo Dam? And as you said, on, on average, 20% um, is coming from behind the dam. That means 80% is actually coming from upstream. So the preponderance of stuff flowing downstream during a big storm event is coming from upstream of the dam. Yeah, I think what, what was surprising to me is that, um, is this notion of dynamic equilibrium. That, that I, my, in my simple view of the world, once the dam got full, everything that came down the river would go over, right? It would just be like what comes in, what comes out. What they are saying, what the scientists say is it's this dynamic equilibrium, which means during big storm events, you get a big scour, so more comes out than is going in, but then that restores the capacity of the dam, and now it can, now it can remove pollution again. And so it's not just that it's sort of in, in, it's in equals out over the long term, but not over the short term, and that matters in terms of um, how the Chesapeake Bay responds uh, um, ecologically in terms of dissolved, effects on dissolved oxygen, for example. That, that makes a difference, whether it comes in sort of uniformly or whether it comes in at a big pulse, but then you get restored capacity at the dam. Well, for one thing, the 80-20 applies to sediments. And as you say, one of the also interesting outcomes of this study is that sediments um, you know, are having an impact, but the fact that the Susquehanna Flats has been doing so great lately, um, you know, at least in the last you know, in the last six years, last couple of years, maybe taking a hit, shows that the, the sediments aren't really the problem. It's, it's the nutrients associated with those sediments, the nutrients associated with what's being scoured, and we don't really have a good handle on the form of those nutrients. Are they available or not? But so, then the question is, so if it is the nutrients, then what are the mitigation options? And, you know, we think that part of a strategy is going to be doing more upstream. Um, it, you know, New York and Pennsylvania, like Maryland, both have watershed implementation plans. You know, they both have plans. They're both moving forward to implement those plans. Do you believe that I mean, uh, as an advocate? Well, we do. We actually have staff in Pennsylvania, seven or eight, six or seven staff who are delivering conservation programs through the Farm Bill, through state dollars. So we are getting buffers on the ground. We are getting farms to you know, do better nutrient management. So we have on the, I mean, stuff is happening for sure in Pennsylvania. They have their plans. Do they need to do more? Do they need to accelerate? Absolutely, they do. Um, but, you know, to say that they're doing nothing is, is not unfair. In fact, in fact, I could show you information that suggests they have far more forested buffers on the ground and have put far more on the ground over the last five or ten years than Maryland has. So they, you know, they are doing stuff. They, they need to do more. They need to accelerate their actions, um, as does New York. Um, but it's not fair for us to say they're not doing anything. You know, New York's a much smaller contributor um, to, to the pollution to the Bay. You know, Pennsylvania's got the, the bulk of the land mass and the watershed is, you know, the, runs right through Pennsylvania. So, you know, New York is looking at upgrading their wastewater treatment plants and agriculture for them is a big one. So they're working with their farmers. So, you know, they are, they're moving forward as well. Um, but that said, we think there does need to be some mitigation for the added nutrients coming over the Conowingo that Exelon needs to be held accountable for those. And the question is, you know, what does that look like? And we think it could be looking upstream at doing more in Pennsylvania, maybe more in, in New York um, than they're required to do under the cleanup plan. Could mean planting oysters. I mean, oysters actually are shown to suck up nitrogen in particular or make um, sediment 
you know, not in a form or nutrients that are not in a form that are available. So, you know, we think we should be thinking broadly about, you know, how can Exelon, you know, mitigate for their impacts that go beyond, you know, just dredging, which we think is probably really, really expensive and has perhaps marginal environmental benefits. You know, the science part says, okay, if you do dredge, what benefits do you get? Which is in this, you know, the Army Corps report, and I'm sure the Colonel spoke to that. And then, how much does that cost? Um, and and then it becomes policy. Then it becomes, well, is it worth you to pay sixty to two hundred and sixty million dollars every year just to sort of keep up with what's coming in there, or could you spend those dollars or some fraction of them on something else that might actually have greater environmental benefits overall. So I think that's the you know, discussion that we should be having. If you simulate implementation of the WIPs, that you get great benefits of dissolved oxygen, you get great benefits for water clarity. If you dredge you know, 3 million cubic yards or even 30 million cubic yards from the Conowingo, you get minuscule benefits to dissolved oxygen um, and, and water clarity. So. So when you look at those two options from from our perspective, you know, again, I think we should be looking at other other mitigation strategies that will reduce nutrients coming down the Susquehanna, um, and that you can perhaps do in a more, much more cost effective way. Is that well, part of the benefit of the WIPs is improvements to local water quality. You know, the the Conowingo Dam is not affecting the Chop Tank River to any large extent. Certainly not upstream, the Chester, the Pocomoke. You know all those rivers, so and many of which have either nutrient sediment impairments. Most, most of not all of them do. So by Dorchester County and the other counties over there implementing their plans, they're going to get you know cleaner local waterways as well. So that's one thing. The second thing I would add is that you know the um, the counties have flexibility in what they do. You know the state told them here's here's your target load that you need to shoot for. Well, there's lots of different ways that you could set up your plan to, to achieve those outcomes. So if you, and, and in many cases, I don't know that the counties chose the most cost-effective ways to do that. So, so, to, so from our perspective, um, we would love to see more cost-effective solutions, and we think that the, the counties have the flexibility to do that um, with, with guidance from the state. There's been a right. lot of concern about the transparency of mm -hmm. the uh, the study group. Right. Well, you know, that they were open to, to the public. I mean, CBF went, there was nothing to preclude anybody from going to the meetings. They put most of the meeting materials online on a web page. Um, they, they haven't released the draft report because, you know, the Army Corps has to go through pretty rigorous peer review, internal review, you know, before it goes out. So, you know, we expect it's going to be coming out, I think, anytime in the next couple of weeks, you know, for, for public comment. But the whole process, again, anybody could have shown up at the meetings. They were, most of them were at MDE um, and participated. There was, there was, as far as I know, there was no exclusion for folks just wanting to, to be around the table and listen to the discussions and, and even ask questions and weigh in. Perception, if you look at that, the satellite, image of stuff coming down the Susquehanna River and somebody says to you, you know, that's coming from behind the dam, it, you know, it, that's, it's a compelling story, I think. But, so, uh, but we, we trust the scientists. Again, you had multiple agencies involved with the study from the Army Corps to U.S. Geological Survey to um, EPA was obviously involved because they're, you know, the water quality gurus. You had the state agencies involved, had the University of Maryland involved. So, I mean, the science from our perspective is, is, um, is impeccable and certainly there's questions to be answered. Rarely do we get all the answers with one study. There's peer review. So, you know, I, I'm not sure what to say to the skeptics other than you, know, you have to trust the, the scientists and it's up to groups like ours to try to convey what is a very complicated subject um, to people to help them understand you know, what's really going on. You know, the framework we have in place right now for cleaning up the bay with the state plans, with the Environmental Protection Agency holding states accountable for implementing their plans, with the short-term pollution reduction goals or milestones that have been the states have all set. Um, that's a framework that we've never had before, a level of accountability that we've never had before, um, and don't have anywhere else in the country. So from my perspective, um, you know, we call it the moment in time for bay restoration, and I 
honestly believe that. There is no other tool under the Clean Water Act that is going to, to clean up the bay um, except for the tool we have right now and we were pushing it to the max. So if, if we fail sort of changing the Federal Clean Water Act, which we don't have a chance of doing right now and maybe not in the foreseeable future, you know, this is our chance. Um, and so for that reason, I'm very optimistic. I mean, we have challenges. Conowingo is one of many working in Pennsylvania to re reduce farmer pollution is another. Reducing, you know, Maryland farmers pollution is, a, you know, is another. So we've got challenges, but we've got the framework to get it done. So it'll be interesting over the next couple of years to see how it plays out.